So thank you everybody for coming. This is Drupal 8 Don't Be Late. We are going to talk a bit about um, a project that we've done in Drupal 8. Um, you know, some of, the, some of the things that set the stage for it. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of talk about what it was and a good deal of lessons we've learned. Number, number 42, late. <laughs> so um, yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's get right into it. So we'll start with the obligatory, who are we? Evan, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, uh, hi, my name is Evan Liebman. I'm the uh, Director of Digital Communications at Memorial Sloan Kettner Cancer Center. Um, so as Frank alluded to, uh, we've got this uh, project in Drupal 8, and um, about 10 days ago, we launched two websites, mskcc.org and sloankettering.edu. And we're going to talk to you a little bit about those sites, um, some of the digital strategy uh, behind that, the sort of the... Uh, the reason for why we pursued Drupal 8, and uh, thank you all for, for being here. Hi, I'm Frank Cabrera. I'm the CTO and, and one of the founders of Phase 2. Um, we worked with uh, Evan and his team to, uh, to build um, mskcc.org and uh, uh, sloankettering.edu. Um, I was involved uh, early on the, on the sales and strategy around it, and, um, and you know, helped to, help to support our teams as they, as they made their way through the murky waters. Hi, I'm... Um, well, I'm Mike Ledoux. I'm head of strategic accounts at Phase Two. Um, I was involved in the MSK project um, in oversight and uh, technical leadership, and uh, help uh, bring this project from uh, concept to actual delivery. Well, so before we start, uh, you know, we think that the time has come to to start considering Drupal Eight. But before we really get into it, I wanted to just kind of do the the show of hand thing to see where people are. So. How many people are actually using Drupal 8 right now? <laughs> small, small handful. There you go. One hand in the back. Yep, small handful. Um, so, how many people are in production with Drupal 8 right now? Four hands, two of which are on the project that we were on. Um, so, who's currently um, running a Drupal 7 site in production or in development? Okay. Wow. Yeah. Most people. What about Drupal 6? Drupal 5? There you go. Hey, there you go, too. All right. Drupal <laughs> 4 point something. 4.7. No, nobody. Okay, good, good. That's good. All right. So like I said, I, uh, we think now is, is definitely the time to consider it. You know, we're going to go through a lot of the, the reasonings, rationale behind that and, and you know, kind of the, the decision points that, that might help you guide, guide you through that, uh, through that process. So one, one quick more raise of hands of just folks who have the D6 site. Are, are you in the process of considering D7 versus D8? Sort of show your hands. Okay, great. So I just wanted to sort of take a step back and um, talk a little bit about content and how content has changed over time. Um, when the internet first started, we didn't even have the World Wide Web. We had things like the Kermit Protocol, and Gopher, and then Tim Berners-Lee gave us the World Wide Web, and you know, from most of our experience, it was text and images, and then you know, came on the scene was was multimedia, and we have YouTube, and now pretty much I'm sure everybody has a Netflix account and listens to streaming music on Spotify, and then we have web applications like Basecamp and, and Trello and Salesforce. And you know, now all of a sudden our contents become our social media streams where we're getting what our friends are doing, what are we doing, and we're generating content, we're consuming content, and then now we have devices. We have Fitbit and your content's being shared and you're competing with your friends on who can do the most steps. Um, there are devices that you can plug into your car that will give you information about your fuel efficiency and, and you know, how well your car is performing. And even the thermostats in your house are content generators now. And so you're consuming this type of content. So our definitive definition of content over time has tremendously changed. And so it, it's very important that you have a platform that's going to be able to um, grow with those changes and be able to adopt to that. So not only has the content itself on the web changed, but how we're consuming this content has changed dramatically over time. Um, Last year, I think the broad consumption of web content online has shifted to primarily over mobile devices. Um, if you have a, 
a property that's servicing younger demographics. That change probably happened two or three years ago, but that's a broad trend where people are not using PCs anymore to consume content. Primarily, they're using their mobile devices, their tablets. So that's changing. Um, over the top, I was just thinking today, I was doing a quick count of how many devices I have in my house that can stream Netflix to my television, and uh, I sort of lost count around 16 devices. Um, so if you think about it, you know, it sort of just popped up. Now we have all these different devices that can stream video content over the internet into our television sets. And you know, over, top, over the top is sort of a big growth area that's just sort of popped up into our lives. But it's really a unique way that we're consuming this content. Um, and it's a unique opportunity where uh, cable companies are being disintermediated and it allows content creators to basically be their own television networks and it's pretty exciting time. Uh, for folks to do that, but it's, it's a change of how we're consuming our content. And just to sort of um, give an idea, you know, now we have wearables. Um, you know, I, somebody I was with the other day has an Apple Watch, you know, Google Glass is another way that people are starting to consume content. And as time has gone on, it's really changed. I haven't, we have the Internet of Things coming up. I don't know how many people here have an Amazon Echo. Nobody? Okay, one, one person, wow. I have an Amazon Echo and I love it. Keep it in the kitchen and you take voice commands, but there's going to be much more of this as time goes on. We're going to see all these devices have uh, capabilities to be able to pull things in from the internet and provide information. And so it, how we're consuming content has really drastically changed over time. And again, with that change means our, we have to be there. Our platforms have to be able to, to provide content on these channels. Yeah, so Drew's addressed, the, I, well, I feel that Drew's addressed a lot of this in his keynote yesterday when he was talking about how the world's evolving and, and you know, he sees it as going from uh, pull to push. Um, I mean, basically, what it all boils down to is that the experience around the content that we, that we have and consume um, needs to change and is changing. Um, you know, we have to better serve our audiences. Um, you know, we want to be where they are. Um, and get the content there, and, and it's now, it's, it's not just content, it's now content and context as well. So what they're doing, when they're doing it, content has to be relevant, like you said, you know, get next best experience. Um, and you know, from, from the side of phase two, what we're seeing is that our clients aren't building websites anymore. Uh, they're basically building what amounts to like content pipelines and, and various distribution channels for, for doing this. They're, they're trying to centralize platforms, but also maximize the reach of of all the content that they have, and and this is driving a lot of the changes, and you know Drupal 8 plays plays into this a lot. And you know the question that you have to ask is, you know, in your business, you know, these changes are happening around us and, and to the people who are in our audience, um, regardless of whether or not you are changing to to remain relevant for them. So you know the question is, could you be disrupted? Um, and we need tool sets that are built for tackling these challenges. We feel that Drupal 8 is, one, is a tool set that is you know, very uniquely positioned to, to help uh, organizations address this. Um, you know, it, it has to be, like I said earlier, it has to be centralized. You have to be able to manage it very well. Um, and you know, if, if you are not getting your content to your users where they are and when they need it, somebody else will, and somebody else is probably already working towards doing that. So it's important to start thinking ahead and, and understand how your business needs to shift and what support you need from the tool sets in order to do that. So we were, we were having a discussion when we were working on this presentation and you know the, the whole idea was don't get left behind. And when I went to Google and tried to search for an image, this came up and uh, it, it's hilarious on a lot of levels. One of which is it only got 4% on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, but, but the description on Rotten Tomatoes was the best. It said, left behind hath begat a further scourge of devastation upon Nicolas Cage's once proud filmography. Um, and, and I think that's true. Um, but, you know, again, ask that question. Is the same thing about to happen to your business? And, and what can you do to prevent that? Are you becoming Nick Cage? <laughs> Don't be Nick Cage. <laughs> So again, Drupal 8, and the question is now the time to start using it. Um, and spoiler alert, like we said before, there's, there, have, there are five people in here <laughs> that are currently using Drupal 8 in production. And I think that's great. These people are, are early to the scene, 
and they're doing a lot to help get Drupal 8 out to everybody else, especially those who are evaluating it or going to have to, you know, redesign or rebuild a, a six or seven site in the, you know, in the next year or so. Yeah, so why is now the time to consider Drupal 8? And you know, these are these are all just, you know, really good reasons why we think it's it's ready or, you know, it, it's able to be done. Um, you know, it's already being used in production. So we have people who have proven that they can take this code base, which, you know, many might consider to be a little too unstable to use, but obviously people have found a way to get stability there and to go live. Um, and it's, you know, it's a great challenge, but, you know, it, it's totally possible. Um, you know, when I say the stack, uh, you know, there's stack support for all the required components, I mean, you know, things like integration with, um, you know, Varnish and Memcache or Redis and, you know, database layers and all of these things, like, that's all there. It's all usable. Um, you know, we did a lot of work to help get uh, Memcache and Redis up to up to snuff for Drupal 8, you know, as well as other folks in the community. Um, and we've proven that, you know, all the, the standard stack components that you generally need to scale on the web today are also available in Drupal 8 and ready to be used. Um, less dependence on contrib, um, you know, I'll let, uh, I think it's Evan talk about this a little bit later, but we're using a a tiny fraction of contrib modules that we'd used previously. Um, Core does so much more and provides so many more facilities that you you can write a little bit of custom code and that, that rids you of the need to have a collection of five contrib modules to provide, you know, the 15% of functionality you actually need and then a bunch of custom code to hide the things that you don't. So um, Core takes you a much, much longer way and that's a really positive thing. Um, so when I say fully recap the benefits of the, uh, the platform lifecycle, um, Drupal 8 isn't even released yet, um, obviously, but even when it is, it, it still has a lot of runway, many, many, many years. If you look at Drupal 7, it's been out since 2011, I believe, like January 2011. Um, and, you know, we're in 2015 now, and, you know, it's going to have support for years after Drupal 8's release. So, you know, there's a really long timeline to, to recoup your investment in Drupal 8. I mean, just, just to sort of get an understanding of that, Drupal 7 came out before HTML5 and CSS3 were a standard. So, right. you know, we've come a long way, and, yep. and Drupal 7 is obviously... Uh, you know, come a long way as well, but Drupal 8 really is the future. Yeah, and that's why we say use a tool built for today's web in the future. I mean, it supports, you know, the way that we build sites, the way that we get content out there, um, you know, Drupal 8 is built with support for that. You know, it's, you know, some of its ideas were from a few years ago, but it's been evolving and features still get into core and things like that. So, you know, we're in a good spot with a good tool that's built and is, is designed to be flexible to allow for the flexibility that we didn't foresee with Drupal 7, it's now kind of built into Drupal 8 to allow the variation in the things, you know, for, for way things, the way things change. Um, and when I say become part of the solution, the earlier you get in, if, if you're in early enough, you can still actually get features that might matter to your business into core if they're relevant to, for Drupal as a platform itself. Uh, once it's released, you know, it's, it's going to be a lot harder to get, actually get features in there. You can get bug fixes, but maybe not get features. Um, and, you know, another thing, if you get in early, that, you know, think about how much talk there is this year about Drupal 8 and how few people, when we raise our hands, are actually using it. You know, people are hearing a lot about it and they want to work on it, they just don't have the opportunity. So if you're there doing things with Drupal 8, you can attract the talent that you want to come work on Drupal 8, push it forward, get your, you know, you know it serves both you and them and it's a great thing. And, and also Drupal 8 does things more in line with what the broader PHP community does. And so um, as, you know, we're struggling to keep up with the demand uh, with the, the Drupal resources we have, um, by, by doing things more in line with the broader PHP community, there's an opportunity there to bring in people who primarily work on Symfony or Laravel or some of these other platforms and bring them into the Drupal community so that they can um, help contribute into that space. So um, I want to share with you a little bit about why we decided to take on Drupal 8. We've been getting a lot of questions about that since we arrived here. Um, a lot of like, are you crazy? What are you doing? Why'd you do that? Um, but you know, there's you know one interesting thing about that is you know when we we set out to do this in April of 2014, but there was we started with phase two then, but um, there was actually an effort prior to that 
um, back in, in probably a year before, April 2013, um, where um, our lead developer, um, Jacob Rockowitz, um, who, you know, he came into our office and we were talking a little bit about the future of our, of our website, and that time we were in Drupal 6. And, you know, he came up with this phrase, you know, D8, don't be late. And um, it's kind of been like our, our you know, you know, sort of what we've been rallying around for the past uh, couple of years. Um, and so that really that drove us to get focused and start thinking about about Drupal 8. And so it, it's actually a lot more than that. You know, that, like I said, that got, kind of got things started. Um, so just real quickly about MSK, we are a cancer hospital. We're located in New York City. Um, we have one single focus, and that's conquering cancer. It's all we do. Um, and so um, if you think about um, um, so, you know, at, at MSK, we have this culture of, of, inno of innovation, and we're really inspired um, by the researchers and clinicians at MSK that, that do their work. And, you know, they regularly push boundaries to generate new knowledge, um, and they continually develop new methods. And, you know, that's really interesting to us because we, you know, my, my group sits in the com um, communications department, and we're just, you know, all of our colleagues are always talking about what this researcher did, what that clinician did, and they always have these breakthroughs and advances, and it's like, well, that's you know, maybe we can do that too. Maybe we can push the limits. And, you know, what they do is about making a difference. It's about changing people's lives. And for them, it's, it's changing the way the world treats cancer. Um, and we're, we're inspired by that relentless effort. Um, and we're driven to do the same in our space. Um, so if you think about what is being done at MSK, um, you know, you, you want to be able to push the boundaries yourself. And, um, you know, some lessons learned from, from our colleagues at MSK, um, you, you know, about innovation. You may not know where it's going. Um, and, and you may not know if it'll work. Uh, but you have to try, and you have to push that really far, um, and you have to push it as far as you can, um, and that's that's what innovation is all about. So, um, you know, at MSK, it's it's more about a collaborative focus, and you know, the, you could refer to it as a community focus. Um, there's you know, multi-center um, studies for clinical trials, um, you know, that you know that span different institutions, and so when I'm being treated with in New York City, you may be being treated with in Los Angeles, and so we we take that data and we we. We put it together and, and we try to find new ideas, new ways to, 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 uh, to push progress on, on delivery of care and, and treatment. Um, and so, you know, one thing that uh, Dries talked about on Tuesday was sort of about like how we come together, not on our own, to develop, to develop new ways to do things. And so like things started to connect here. Like we started, you know, we took a look at, you know, our, our focus, our strategies, and we said, well, how does this relate to, to Drupal and to the community? Um, and, you know, we asked this question, like, why is, why is community so important? Um, and, you know, we're trying, we're all trying to solve similar problems. We can leverage um, our work, we can leverage other people's work, um, and we can allow bigger problems to be solved. And in the community, whether it's um, patient care, research, education, Drupal, um, it, it helps to drive innovation. And there's just, there were just so many strong and compelling parallels here for what we're doing at MSK to the Drupal community. Um, and, and one other thing, G Dries talked about caretakers. Um, and free riders. And, you know, it, it's the caretakers who really help to drive innovation. So we thought, you know, this is great. We want to be in this space. This is what we want to do when we want to push this forward. Um, so, I mean, that's great. That's that's really focuses on innovation and generation of new knowledge, but that wasn't quite enough for us. We said, you know, we need to think a little bit more about the strategic priorities in MSK and, and all the things that we do and all the things that we think about. Um, and so it's, you know, it's, it's patient experience, it's access, it's talent recruitment, and it's financial sustainability. Um, and so as we examined that and, and pushed toward Drupal 8, uh, we realized that all of these actually line up with what's happening in Drupal 8. Um, so if you think about patient experience and access, uh, you know, Mike talked about this earlier, being able to serve personalized experiences by pushing content to users um, that we know they want. And so we don't have authentication on, on our Drupal 8 sites right now, but we may one day. Um, and so that was really about choosing a platform that would power us to do that. Um, talked a little bit, I won't repeat myself here, but, uh, you know, just being, you know, on, in D8 on the cutting edge of technology and everything I said about innovation and generation of new knowledge was really exciting to us. Uh, talent recruitment, this was, this was a big one for me. I, you know, when we assessed Drupal 8, I thought, well, you know, Drupal 8 can really, has an opportunity to broaden the talent pool. And the reason for me was, you know, with the use of um, Symfony and object-oriented programming, you know, I felt that there's developers who probably scoff at Drupal and say, well, I'm, you know, I do... Symphony and object-oriented programming. I'm not even thinking about Drupal. It's not on my radar. So they're not here today, and you know they'll learn about it soon. And you know, just they're gonna they're gonna come in here and they're gonna start working with us and, and pushing this forward. And you know, I thought that that, that was really exciting. 
and uh, financial sustainability. And when we, when we knew that we were doing a redesign, um, well, actually, every every project that we've done, every update um, that we've done at MSK to our CMS has always been coupled with a redesign. So, you know, we felt that back in 2000, April 2014, if we we're going to do a redesign, well, we don't want to do it in Drupal 7 and then launch in April of 2015 and start thinking about Drupal 8. You know, from, you know, we need to be financial stewards and we need to watch, you know, what we spend. Um, and, you know, it didn't make sense to us. We, we felt like th there was more value in funding a core contributor, um, who's Jonathan Hedstrom at, at Phase 2, um, to help push this project along for us rather than, launch, you know, spending all the money on a redesign, just strategy and, and, and design, spending all the money to migrate to Drupal 7 and then having to do it all over again. It just, it didn't really work for us. So the adventure begun, and, and, and we launched, um, successfully launched two sites um, about 10 days ago. Uh, we saw an opportunity, and we seized it. Um, so a little bit about this site. I mean, this is, this is not a brochure site. This isn't, this isn't your blog. Um, it's not your company website. This is a major Drupal 8 enterprise site. Uh, we went from 114 contrib modules to nine using Drupal 8. We serve seven personas. We have related content, faceted search, and the list, is, the list is endless. Prediction tools, multi-server cluster, data aggregation, LDAP, uh, data synchronization to apps. It's a pretty big site. So, um, you know, Drupal 8's flexibility really helped to simplify problems for us. Um, you know, we can centralize logic into services, um, you know, um, having to, you know, override controllers without, without hacking core. Um, you know, we created uh, YAML forms. There was no web forms. There's still no web forms available for Drupal 8, so we created web forms using YAML. Um, no panels, so we used um, HTML template expansion. Um, and there were many D8 module upgrades um, that only took us a few days of work, and a couple of examples, Redis, Memcache, and, and Node Order. Um, so what else did we, did we gain from Drupal 8? And I think if you ask everybody, you know, Jake and, and Toby who are here today and, you know, Jonathan or Brad Reid or, or Mike, you know, they were going to have different answers. Um, but, you know, for me, what I saw, which was, I thought was just so amazing, was the, the devel developer velocity. Um, and, and once they got past that learning curve, we were able to fly. And so this project, I said, it began in April of 2014. We did not get the designs. Uh, we didn't start the design process until September. Um, and so this was really, really rapid process. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, Toby and I were chatting this morning and he said, um, he said it took about three weeks total uh, of the project. And it was probably, you know, one to two weeks in the, in the beginning. Um, and then over the next month or two was probably another one to two weeks just to, um, you know, get down the, um, the, the way things are being done in, in Drupal 8. And architecturally it's different, but many, many concepts are, are still there from previous versions. So. Um, it, it wasn't too big of a of a lift, and uh, and finally the, on this slide, the, you know, you know, MSK was able to participate in in making Drupal eight better, and that's going going back to Jonathan Hedstrom and and the work that he did to push forward Core. So yeah, there were there were lots of surprises. Um, core features weren't as done as people believed them to be, and you know, one example is uh, the views couldn't filter by date range. Um, you could pick a date, but not a range. Um, and, and I think actually the biggest surprise here, and you know, I won't read through all of these, is that there wasn't a release by now, or by the time we started. Um, so I think that you know, to us, you know, having been so much talk about Drupal 8 over the past few years, uh, when we set out to do this, um, you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't there and ready for us. So that was probably the biggest surprise. Um, and so some trade-offs we made with Drupal 8. Now, there weren't many contrib modules. Um, you know, lack of best practices and practical knowledge. And we did a session yesterday, and Brad Wade was talking about something that he needed to do. And you know, he he went to, to Google to go find the answer, and he couldn't find any answers. So I mean, it's you know, come, you know, it, that really hurt us a little bit. You know, but you know, then, you know, historically Drupal is you know very well known for their documentation, and you know, we trust it'll all be there. But it's you know, it's it's kind of uh, the trade-off that you make when you go through this project. You realize that you're going to have to lead the way a little bit, find out things on your own. All right, cool. So let's uh, let's get into a little bit, you know, uh, thanks, Em. You talked a bit about uh, the lessons learned and things that kind of surprised us and didn't. Um, we, what we want to 
to break down kind of the lessons learned uh, a little bit more so that we could go through them. Um, I'm not even sure how many we have. We probably have about 20. Yeah. So 20 or so lessons learned, and I'm sure that we're missing some of them, and, and the team could, could probably fill in on, on many more. So heckle us if we miss a couple here. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so we broke it down into sections. Uh, this first one we're going to talk a little bit about managing kind of core and contrib, like the, the code base stuff and, and how, that all, how that all shook out. So uh, what we found to be invaluable is dedicating a person to core. Um, you know, it probably sounds, you know, obvious or simple or whatever, but, um, you know, we had Jonathan Hedstrom uh, basically focused on core, and he was um, – he was basically, he was clearing ground. Anytime an issue came up, a bug or whatever, they could, they could throw it to him and he could, um, he could research it, he could find patches, he could re-roll patches, he could create them, uh, and then he could also shepherd them to make sure they actually got into uh, Drupal 8. So he, as of uh, yesterday, uh, directly from this project, there were 57 patches that were contributed and committed to Drupal core. Um, Beyond that, there were hundreds of issues that he had worked on, uh, just either marking them re-roll or, or working through needs review. Um, he said that the oldest issues that he came across that were in needs review were four years old. So that means that somebody made the effort to create a patch for Drupal 8, put it in a queue, marked it needs review, and it sat there for four years before anybody even looked at it. So he went through and cycled, he basically created a list of you know the needs review and he started at the oldest one. It was four years old. And by the time he was done, about uh, maybe a month or so later, um, he had that down to about four months. So things are now sitting, you know, at, at most four, four, uh, four to six months in the queue. Um, and yeah, you know, sometimes you have sometimes you have to code and work around bugs in core too. And you know, he was he was able to help with the with strategies around that and just generally be a wealth of knowledge for the team that was actually trying to get all of this hard work done. So that was really key. Um, schedule for regular upgrades to core. Um, obviously, there's you know there's betas that get rolled and things like that, and it's important to not get too far behind. So you have to plan to regularly migrate between releases. And the thing that made it a huge challenge um, is that there are no there's no migration um, path currently from betas from one beta to another. Um, we obviated a lot of that with uh, we got rid of that because Jake actually wrote a decent module that would allow us to. Um, just take the, the content from, a pre from the Drupal 6 site and just re-import it. So a really good migration process kind of helped us around the fact that there was not a good uh, internal beta-to-beta -beta migration process. Um, yeah, and, and the thing is don't let your, don't, don't wait too long because every, every day there's more commits to core. So every day your active stable code base is accumulating debt from the currently moving ahead uh, head. So you know, stay as up to date as possible, um, and then realize that at some point you're going to have to say we're not upgrading because we have to release in the next you know couple of weeks or months or whatever. And I think right now, uh, am I, if I'm correct, they're on beta seven. Beta seven. Yeah. Which you know, beta eight and nine are basically the same thing. So and there is beta ten now. So two versions back, um, and you know that'll get that'll get knocked out. Right. And <coughs> there's a decision to be made about waiting for the beta to beta. Uh, migration path or release candidate right. or jump on the next beta. Yep. <clears throat> so one of the lessons that we, we learned uh, in the early planning on this, we did an analysis of the contrib space in D8 and um, some of the early planning uh, was do we wait for contrib to catch up and hope that it catches up to when we need it or do we not? And we learned very early on don't wait on contrib. Um, you, you just can't. I mean, to give a good example, features, which is a phase two managed module, wasn't ready. So even our own modules weren't ready. So you have to be able to account for either jumping in and help pushing it along, like we did with um, some of the stack components like Memcache and Redis and LDAP, um, or coming up with novel solutions to get around the fact that these uh, pieces of functionality are not available in the contrib space for you. But the good news is, because so much is in core, your necessity to depend on Contrib is much lessened. And as Evan said earlier, the D6 site was 114 modules, and you know the D8 site has nine modules, and honestly, out of those nine modules, maybe three or four of them are actually necessary for the functionality of the site. I mean, that's just a huge differentiation between 
the way things were done in previous versions of Drupal versus D8. Yeah, so when you when you think about, um, I don't know how many were here for the Drupal set, the, the six to seven upgrade, but you know, seven launched in, in January, I think um, there, there wasn't a lot there and you know, we were, we were writing a lot of, of custom things over again. Um, and it wasn't until views actually got upgraded, which was about six months later, that the rest of Contrib followed by. So it was it was nine to twelve months before Drupal set after Drupal 7's initial release that it was actually usable by most people. And that timeline was almost doesn't exist right now because you can start using most things um, right away. Uh, and just to kind of clarify, features actually does have an alpha release now. There was I think a session on it yesterday. And you still you you still need it for certain use cases. Yeah. Absolutely. So the next section is uh, we're going to talk about just addressing some of the risks inherent in working with alpha slash beta software since this project started before there, I think, was a D8 beta. Oh, it started, started before alpha. <laughs> oh, alpha 3, three okay. Go. So there you go. started very early. <clears throat> so um, one of the things that it, it was interesting is early on is, <clears throat> and this is something that Jake did to really start to get sort of momentum on this project something you talked about yesterday in the other session and it's available online, we'll have links at the end, is using prototyping to mitigate risk. And really what he did was he focused on getting some content out of the D6 site, getting it into the D8 site, getting that content to render, don't worry about the theming, don't worry about all that stuff, just Bartik is fine and just get that prototype working and then work on that prototype to prove that it's possible. And from there, he used that to, to garner um, consensus to continue to move in this direction and get, get us towards a D8 launch. Yeah, I'll also add that, you know, all of us are uh, accountable for what we do and, you know, our jobs. And so, you know, to show that, it, that this could be done in a prototype was a big deal in MSK because it, you know, it just gave us the, the strength to keep moving forward and, you know, it got a tremendous buy-in uh, within our department just, just to be able to show it that this is working and we can do it. And, and so th some of the engineering, the interesting engineering aspects of this, is, uh, this project was in the migration process, and YAML was extensively used a lot in that. But, but I think one of the points that Jake made earlier is, especially even earlier on, is just doing SQL bulk inserting from, from one to the other, maybe doing some mapping as the tables, layout change. That's completely valid early on to prototype what you're doing. So really prototype to make sure that you can mitigate the risks that are inherent in working in this type of software. Yeah, so obviously the next one seems super obvious, account for the learning curve. Um, you know, uh, we found it was totally true that while it, it took some people, you know, it took everybody a while to get up to, you know, how, how things are done in Drupal 8, they certainly made up the time later with how fast they were actually able to get things accomplished. Um, so, you know, when you're planning a project on Drupal 8, expect the first few sprints to go a lot slower than you anticipate. And then, you know, if the team does the right job and, and picks up the right, you know, the best practices and, and figures things out, expect their, their velocity to increase as the project goes on. Um, you know, the, the way that Drupal 8 is built, um, you know, OO, services, Symphony, things like that, it allows you to do a lot more with a lot less code. You know, you can, you can extend um, core classes, override, you know, just override methods. Um, even just creating modules, there's so much less boilerplate that you have to write, which means there's kind of less things to go wrong, less bugs to track down when there's less boilerplate code that you make, and it, it just overall increases the, uh, the velocity there. It also lessens the surface area of what you have to test, right? So if you're taking an object and extending it, you can test that extension and not have to test the whole module. Um, you know, one of the other things here is um, Sometimes you have to unlearn the way things work in six and seven and not make the assumption that they work the same way in eight. Uh, one interesting conversation within this project as we were talking about setting up memcache and talking about how um, in the traditional D6 and D7 setting, each node knows about each other's node's memcache to be able to clear the cache. Well, in D8, it doesn't necessarily work that way. You can do cache invalidation in the back end of the database. And that was something that was sort of Jonathan Hedstrom brought up to Toby and I um, and something we just didn't know about. And so sometimes you have to, even something as simple as setting up memcache is different in D8. So um, the approaches are different. You have to learn the different approaches for the new technology. And, you know, a, b a big one here, which isn't obvious and, and wasn't, is don't assume that you'll know what will go well. Uh, just because, you know, people talk a lot about things and, you know, how, 
how mature they are or, or you know how long they've been around it doesn't mean that they're gonna work for your needs um, you know the what Evan mentioned earlier like you know date modules in core views modules in core and that was all great but they weren't working together and you know you would just normally expect that they were probably working together if they were both in there so these are things that you just have to account for so it's just really important to kind of have plan B's and C's and, and don't just blindly go ahead saying I know that these things are gonna work just know what you're gonna do if they don't um, and and you know over time you'll you'll kind of figure out what kind of what will work and what won't and you'll have much better confidence in knowing that you can tackle the challenges it, that, that appear I mean and one one thing that we learned in this project is even something like the stack of what version of PHP what version of a memcache that works completely well in D6 and Z7, we had problems in D8. And so you, you have to be um, cognizant of the fact that, you know, just the stack alone, something that you might take for granted on other builds, you have to, to be able to assume that that could not necessarily work in D8. You might have to change, change make changes to your stack. And that was a lesson we had to learn. Yeah, I mean, you know, Memcache and PHP 5.4 were having seg faults and, you know, couldn't figure out what was going on. And, and um, you know, an upgrade to 5.5 and they just magically disappeared. But there were a lot of steps between that and making the decision to go to 5.5. It was um, not a finger snap. Yes, it was not a finger snap. So um, we spent a lot of time trying to make it work in 5.4, um, but you know, being flexible and being able to, to even change something in your stack like your PHP version can really help alleviate some of those issues. Next section we kind of call pulling it all together because it's a lot about uh, teams and, and collaboration and you know, Every build, you know, while there's lots of code powering it, there's also lots of people involved. Um, and, you know. So um, one of the interesting things about this project, if it wasn't sort of complicated enough trying to launch a site on alpha software slash beta software, um, was that the way that the front end was done is there, were, there was actually, uh, I would say, three distinct teams on this project. There was the uh, MSK team, that includes Jake and Evan and some other folks. Um, there was the phase two development team, but then also working on the front end side and doing some, some content strategy work was Digitas. And the way that the front end was designed was that it was uh, built as a standalone prototype. And from that standalone prototype, that was used to um, get um, uh, basically um, buy-in or consensus or basically uh, being able to validate those designs are good for the client. And from there, that was, throughout a build process, migrated and brought into um, the Drupal 8 site. And so some of the things that really helped there was Twig. It's, it, it's extremely powerful um, and it really helped out a lot um, in helping build out the front end, especially when there weren't a lot of layout options to be able to lay out pages in Drupal 8. There's no, there was no panels at the time. I don't think still probably isn't panels right now. Plans. Yep. Um, one of the things that we really we did do is take advantage of some of the, the newer front-end JavaScript tool sets, such as Grunt. Uh, we use Grunt tremendously throughout this project. Uh, we use Bower to manage front-end dependencies, um, and SAS and a bunch of other uh, JavaScript tools. Um, and if you watch the other session uh, that was earlier, there's a, a lot larger discussion about the tooling in the front-end. Um, and so one of the interesting problems that we had out of uh, that project was that there are these front-end components, um, and I won't sort of get too deep into it, uh, but the solution to be able to do some of these layouts, the, the solution to be able to actually um, take these very rich um, HTML components and put them even in the body of the content, which is a difficult problem to do um, when you have production people putting this content together, um, was that uh, Jake built this sort of service object that allows it to take in um, simplified HTML that production people can put in there uh, with a specific targeted class and then expand that out uh, on rendering to a much more complicated HTML layout. And uh, in the database, the simplified HTML stayed in there. Uh, the production people can manage the very simplified HTML, but when it's expanded, you can get super rich things like this call out here where that's actually in the body of the content. And, and there's a number of different components in there that give the editorial team tremendous flexibility. And Evan, you can talk a little yeah, bit about Yeah, so we that. have, you know, we have a lot of nodes um, on the site and because, you know, the site's 25 to 30,000 nodes. And so there's just a lot of content and, you know, for the ability for a web producer or a writer or an editor to go into the site and just put in some really simple HTML and, and it renders this. And, you know, so that, 
that approach really helped us to you know to to speed things up in the production process and um it also shows that you can have like very non technical people um going in here in into into the editor and and just dropping in this very simple html and and work rendering this you know this design yeah i mean uh, if you could speak a little bit about sort of the initial estimates of what it would take for the tile template pages and yeah so we have um you know one of our one of the templates about we have like 8 to 10 templates on on the website and um one of the templates is a tile template and so we were you know put we were up against time and you know time was really tight for this project and so it was about mid march and we had approved designs for the tile template and planning to launch in april and so you know Brad and you know other folks at phase 2 leading the front end integration looked at this and said well it's going to take us about 20 days to integrate the you know five to six variations of those tile templates and so through you know through this api we were able to knock that down to about 3 days and so it just you know it really helped accelerate the project and push it forward and get us to to launch and the nice thing about that system is it's extensible it uses twig templates under the covers and so um it it's extremely maintainable as well So with that um you know I talked a little bit about sort of how there were different teams on the on this project and so it it's really important to actually have the teams very cohesive and have the collaboration very tight um again one of the unique prospects of this project was that there was this front end team that was out there building these prototypes and then there was a front end integration team that was taking those um having an automated build process that builds the front end prototype pulls some of the assets over into the drupal build and so what that means is there's a lot of coordination that has to happen between those teams and what we've learned when you have something like that is that sometimes um you can leverage twig and you can take the the sort of perfect html given uh, in the prototype and you can do that kind of 90% of the time but 10% of the time it's easier to just take the drupal default of a view or what not and give that to to the other team and say can you please use this as the basis and that was a good lesson learned that sometimes there's a give and take between team coordination that sometimes it's it's fine drupal's very malleable and sometimes it's easier to not fight drupal and to just say use drupal's defaults as the starting point and that helped us out a lot to get over a bunch of things that were would be difficult otherwise to accomplish yeah another another lesson is when you're when you're transitioning across a code base that is in active development and we mean the entire code base uh there's a really big chance for regressions as you move forward and you know every time we would upgrade there would be you know there would be lots of things that would break and you know one of the very smart things that the team did is they built a, a large suite of uh of tests to to te you know to basically identify what was breaking when you would when you would go there was you know something like 50 plus uh test suites that would run and you know you'd you'd upgrade core underneath the code base and you'd run the test and basically they would all break and then you at least had indicators of where to go look you see why each test breaks and you dig in you determine is it an api change is it a data change you know where where did everything fall apart but you know we can't um we can't overstate how important it is to have uh comprehensive tests to to really exercise the code base to know where things break because being able to find them like if you're just relying you know on meat space and you know you you do a no, new build and people just start clicking on on you know on your site and following links and submitting forms you're never going to find all of it and it's going to be it's going to take days and days and days so you know automating that through you know php unit uh and bhat and and other things like that really go a long way for you and you know you know php unit in drupal 8 uh, allows you know allows for much much easier testing you know you can mock things if you need to so you don't have to test the entire code base um and you know like uh like michael said earlier it's a lot easier when you're just overriding something on an object you know you you get the test that comes with it and then you know your override just has to test the thing that you've changed you don't have to write a test for the entire component all over again so um you know you get a lot more um you get like a force multiplier there and just you know one of the sort of long term great benefits of the way the drupal is structured is um because there's a dependency injection container testing something like an email service uh, has the ability to uh pull up that that live service object and replace it with a mock object so that you're not actually generating mails when you're trying to do tests so there's a lot of opportunity within drupal 8 to really expand test coverage and to do uh, a lot more of testing that would be a little bit more difficult to do in 6 and 7 if not almost impossible So we used a lot of there was a lot of build 
in this project, um, and there was a lot of migration in this project. And so one thing we learned very early on is to automate as much as you possibly can um, and do it as soon as possible. Um, you, you, want, you, you want to maintain the automation as opposed to have to hand do things because uh, especially when things break, you're going to be doing it over and over again. So automation is key there. Uh, and in this project, we used a, a combination of Drush, um, but we actually used Grunt quite a bit in, in a bunch of the different processes. And it's actually a really good tool and works really well with Drupal um, to do a number of different things within the build process. And there was actually a session on uh, Grunt Drupal tasks um, that you can go see. I think it was from yesterday. And, and so one of the unique things, again, about the fact that there was this front-end prototype and then there was this uh, Drupal build repository was that uh, we had a build process that would go and build that prototype um, project and then take and move things from that build into the Drupal build. And so that was all automated. So there was a lot of complexity in there. Um, and Grunt was really up to the task you know, as long with, um, with Drush to be able to do things like that. And then that allows you to, as you're launching, uh, as you're launching those into um, different environments, you can manage that through sort of a Jenkins process and be able to really automate a lot of this stuff. Yeah, so, you know, we talked about, you know, uh, automating things and, you know, managing your dependencies really goes a long way towards, um, towards enabling uh, automation. So, you know, like you said, Drush Make is used to kind of build the Drupal site. Um, it actually now has uh, YAML support for make files, although uh, that wasn't used here. Um, you know, NPM is used to manage, um, to manage the dependencies for Grunt. Um, Bower was used to manage dependencies for the front end. Um, and then, you know, Grunt was actually used as that tool to materialize the site and to build the front end and kind of manage the whole hacking process. So YAML has gotten us around a lot of different uh, potential potholes in this project. And so one of the big key pieces of functionality as we were starting to build out the site was there's no web form module. Uh, and the MSK site has a tremendous amount of web forms. I don't even know how many forms. Yeah, probably 200. 200. So there's about 200 web forms on the site, and we didn't have a way to actually build web forms. There's a form API, but there is no real way to actually design and build those. And so uh, Jake built a module uh, called YAML Forms, which allows um, production people or developers or anybody to define a, a YAML document that defines what that web form should be composed of and that it takes that YAML configuration and then generates the underlying web form. And what that allowed is that it, the lift to, to allow the team to be able to build these web forms was much lower without having to actually build in big GUI or basically rebuild the entire web form module from D7 to D8. And so it, that got around a very, very big challenge of how do we provide this functionality to the site without having to take on a tremendous lift. And one thing we did find out is that non-coders can use YAML. And with a little bit of training, it's pretty, pretty simple and pretty um, dependable and maintainable for, um, for folks to use. So it, it's an interesting way to provide an interface for folks to be able to uh, configure a system and to create content. Um, it also is used quite a bit in um, data migration and serialization. And uh, one of the interesting things that was done on the project is on the D6 site, the uh, YAML Symphony component was installed on the D6 site so that it could uh, export out um, content and data into YAML format for the D8 site to be able to ingest. You know, when this project started, there wasn't, the migrate API wasn't there, there was no migrate module. And so YAML was a very good sort of lingua franca to be able to um, get the the data and the content into a format that's easily digestible and easily um, generatable uh, for the system. And so that, that's definitely an option in the content migration part and ways to get data out of your D6 and D7 site is to install that Symfony component and start to use that in order to output YAML um, data to be able to be in, ingested into D8. Yeah, and you know, the, another, another really big lesson learned is that um, you shouldn't treat your migration as a second class citizen. So, you know, it's, it, a lot of times it's easy to say, well, we're just going to use this migration once or, you know, and so let's just throw it together quickly so that we can get some content from one site to another and, you know, we're going to throw it away. We won't need it after launch. And while it's true that you might not need it after launch, um, developing on Drupal 8, there's things changing all the time. So you're constantly having to, to 
to upgrade and modify your migration scripts as core changes as well. So, so spending some time and having a really good, solid, bulletproof migration process that you can work with over time to modify as core changes and as your site changes, um, and being able to do constant migrations and blow things away and remigrate them. I mean, that's just that's key, and it was really useful to both help validate content coming in, but also you know validate that the structures of the data were correct and things like that. And, and the migration part of this project was really unique, and I, I would definitely recommend checking out the uh, the, the other session. Um, that's uh, the link is at the end of this presentation. Um, but one of the interesting things with how the migration was approached was that the migration happened continuously throughout the project. And what that allowed for is that there wasn't this sort of editorial blackout period or this double entry period. Um, and in, it's, in some ways, it's super unique in the fact that um, even things like IA changes um, would happen on the D6 site, and the migration process would begin into the D8 site. So some of the actual active development that happened on D6 and got pulled into D8 through the migration process. And that's certainly a unique facet of this project and the approach to get this done. Yep. No, uh, no site would be complete without environments and places in which to run. So we'll touch on a couple of those uh, when we set up time. Yep. So you know, make it really easy for developers to get set up. Um, you know, it, um, if you don't have something that's bulletproof, things can be you know, obviously really fragile between you know, between different people's computers or environments and things could break and you spend a lot of time uh, trying to get that all in sync and you're up against a big enough challenge anyway working with, with Drupal 8 and, and making sure that you make progress there. So don't waste time on uh, development environments. Get something set up early, make it consistent and go with that. And try to keep it as simple as possible. I mean, some of the challenges we had is having the VMs be able to connect to a VPN, having this long build process and getting that set up on everybody's machine just took a lot of time and so Certainly, you want to simplify it so to get your developers productive early. Sure. Um, don't neglect your server environments. Um, I would say try to get your servers up as early as possible. Um, we sort of got them up more towards the end of the project, and it, I, I wouldn't advise that. Um, server environments are a tricky thing, uh, and even between you know sort of dev stage and production. Things can change, and even if they're built on an images and using Puppet or Ansible or something, they still have unique little differences. And so those types of bugs with environmental issues and environmental configuration are really hard to track down. So try to get your environments up as early in the project as you possibly can and start getting those builds done on those so that you can ferret out those issues and not have to deal with it right prior to launch. Yeah, and you know, that leads into how small differences can, you know, can cause serious issues. Um, Close enough doesn't really work. Uh, if you really want to have consistency between your environments, you know they they should be running all the same components of the stack. Uh, they should be running them uh, on the same versions. Um, ideally, they will be running in the same configuration. So if you have your database on another server, you want at least one environment before your production environment that has database on another server. So um, you need to get that set up and tested. Uh, and be able to deploy to those things as soon as you can and, and minimize the variation between them. Um, and then, you know, even little things like on the same servers, you know, if you're hitting it with a pre-production URL and when you cut over to your production URL, there can be issues. So have ways of testing those things. Um, one thing that we learned is that load tests, they're great and they're great indicators of your environment and how it's going to stand up, but it is not a guarantee that even if your site does well under load testing, that under production traffic, it's going to be the same. It's just not the same thing. Um, and so um, even if, you know, we even took production traffic logs and used those as the basis for the load test and still under production load, things change, things are different. And so just, uh, just realize that load testing isn't a, a guarantee of anything. Um, and one other thing, um, even when you're launching on a, what you perceive as a low traffic time, sometimes that's, that's a, you know, it's great, but sometimes, uh, as we learned, uh, as we launched, uh, a large university had a pretty aggressive spider that I guess was turned on roughly around the time when we relaunched and started to aggressively start to index the site at, you know, and I think it generated 96,000 uh, page views within less than an hour. So uh, even when you think you're launching at a time that you have low traffic, Prepare because you never know. Somebody's could have a spider starting to index your site pretty aggressively. Yeah. So how can you get started? We have you know just a couple of like considerations for when you're trying to decide should you go Drupal eight or not. Um, 
I think that it's really important that you pick the candidates carefully, like you know which project you do, might do or which site or something. I mean, you have to have a little bit of tolerance for risk. You know, things can go wrong, and, and you know your stakeholders and your team they have to be kind of ready to deal with that. So if you have a fragile team or really you know uh, if something's under immense scrutiny, you might want to you know reconsider or, or just see what you can do to mitigate some of that risk. Um, no short timelines. I mean, it, it's hard to predict. Like we said, don't don't make assumptions about what'll go right and go wrong but you know it's hard to hard to predict what'll happen so if you have a really tight timeline and really hard hard pressure there again it's, it, it might not be um, the best choice um, have the right team I mean you know this would not have been possible uh, at all if we didn't have the team that we had with the expertise they had um, with the support that they had from the organizations um, you know having you know, even though Drupal 8 is vastly different, knowing Drupal is very important. So having that experience, knowing, you know, knowing the differences, it's, it's really important. You have to have quick learners and problem solvers. Um, you know, you have to have people who, um, who can, you know, do profiling to spot performance problems. Um, you have to have people that are, like, empathetic and really good at working with each other. Um, you know, things can get really stressful, and it's important that, you know, you have people that come together and are on the same team. Absolutely. Uh, if you have a highly dysfunctional team, I don't recommend, you know, working on unstable software to try to go into production. It seems really, seems really <laughs> obvious, but, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's something to keep in mind. Um, and, you know, get really involved in the community and, and make connections, and this is a great conference to do all of that, because you will, you'll need people's help, whether it's to review patches to help get them committed to core, or if you're just banging your head on something, being able to jump into IRC and, and reach out to someone you might know, or, I mean, you, you can even reach out to people you don't know, but, you know, just be, to be able to ask for help from people that know more is just really important. So, you know, uh, the, the outreach effort is really important there to, to kind of bring you know, not only the support of your team for each other, but also, you know, having the com community support you in, in your cycles as well. So uh, this is some additional information around this project, um, and the link for the Adventures in Drupal is the other site that gets a little bit more into the tech details. Um, but here are some links to additional information about the site uh, and about the project. We don't have a ton of time, maybe a minute or two, but if there are any questions, Come up to the mic, thanks. How you doing? This question is more for Evan, and it's not meant to answer the actual question, but it's more about how you were setting the expectations above you. What was the contingency plan, or what is the contingency plan, since D8 is still not released, in terms of a breaking change that might get into D8 at this point? So, sort of like, like what, so like, if they were to pull out views, all of us, I mean, that's not going to, that's not going to happen, but if, if there was something that was like not easily recoverable, you, you'd be stuck where you are. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I, I think we're pretty comfortable where we are in beta seven and we feel like we're, we're pretty stable. Um, you know, we'll, we'll be looking to, you know, for the upgrade path to, to see if we can um, continue to move forward with Drupal. But I, I mean, I, I don't think there's, there's no contingency plan to fall back on anything. I think, you know, we feel pretty comfortable um, with where we are now. So. And, and again, one of the benefits of being in early is that you help you have a little bit more say to help try to guide Drupal to where you want to be. So if the potential for something like views to get pulled out of Drupal 8, you, you, you know, you have that opportunity to, to at least weigh in before that decision is finalized where. Yeah, I, I, my, my real question is more about setting the expectations above you. For people who aren't, they're not necessarily in the weeds on this. They don't necessarily get the nuances of it. I mean, we, we could oh. all sit around and kind of talk about yeah, the no, I think, what we I think would do. The, okay, so, um, you know, it's um, the process that we went through to, to push forward in Drupal 8 was really transparent um, at MSK. And um, there, there was there was large collaboration just on the MSK side with, with team members outside of our department um, and, and a, a large learning process for what we're doing. So, you know, we've been very open about the risk of Drupal 8 since the start because we didn't, you know, this, we talked about this earlier as far as, you know, you don't, you don't know where things are going to go, and you don't know how things are going to work out, but you just got to keep pushing. And so, you know, we, we continue to push that forward, know, knowing fully that there could be some major issues. But uh, as I said, we were very transparent about that. Thanks. Cool. So thanks, everybody. We have to actually stop right now because there's a panel coming up here. But, you know, we can ask, answer some questions off on the side or, so, or something. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, what's up? So, uh, I actually
triple six or seven. Triple six, yeah. yeah. So what was your team size? Uh, we had, um, well, there's like the...